And uh, we're so delighted to welcome you to uh, our first uh, of our Kennedy Lecture Series uh, this semester. Uh, as many of you know, uh, our Kennedy Center Lecture Series this semester uh, focuses on the theme of engaging global inequality. And we have a really rich array of, of speakers uh, from BYU and abroad uh, who will be joining us uh, throughout the semester for this lecture series, which will take place uh, almost every Wednesday um, here in this room uh, at noon. We'd like to turn the time now to Leslie Hadfield, who's joining us on Zoom, uh, and she will introduce our speaker today. Thank you. It is a pleasure to introduce Thomas Isbell today. When we were looking at this topic or the theme for the lecture series, we reached out to the Afrobarometer uh, for someone who could come and shed some light on engaging global inequality in Africa. The Afrobarometer is an African owned and managed uh, pan African nonpartisan survey research project that measures citizen attitudes on democracy and governance, the economy, civil society, and other topics across the continent. It has over 35 partners throughout the continent and some in Europe and the United States, including a partner and support unit in Cape Town, South Africa, where Thomas Isbell is currently based. And it really is the leader in survey research across the continent, which is why we reached out to the Afrobarometer. There's, they've got 75 to 80% coverage on the continent's uh, population. So it's really wonderful that we have uh, someone here. Thomas Isbell came highly recommended by the Afrobarometer staff to speak uh, to us today to kick off our semester's theme. He has studied inequality and democratic participation using representative survey data for 34 African countries particularly looking at the consequences of perceptions of individual material inequality on democratic legitimacy. And he has published research on democracy, equality, taxation, and so social service delivery with the Afrobarometer. Um, and his research has been featured in the Washington Post and the Africa Report, as well as various South African media. Some of his recent work deals with COVID-19, and unequal services and democracy in South Africa, trust and perceptions of corruption in Botswana and the Gambia's recently proposed constitution. He holds a bachelor's degree in political science from the University of Mannheim, Germany, and a master's degree in international relations from the University of Cape Town, South Africa, where he recently submitted his PhD thesis. So he's awaiting the final uh, word on that. Throughout his doctoral studies, he has worked on the data management team of the Afrobarometer survey project and has also taught undergraduate and graduate level courses on international political economy, democracy in Africa, survey design and data analysis methods. And he also serves as the co-instructor of the Afrobarometer analysis and writing workshop series. So we are really privileged to have Thomas Isbell come and speak to us today. And we felt it would be a wonderful way to to start this lecture series so that we can understand more about how to measure and talk about inequality. So I'll now turn the time over to Thomas. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for the kind words. Sorry, I've been told that I need to share my screen. Uh, and unfortunately, then you'll not be able to see me anymore. Um, so I hope that's what I'm doing. Okay, uh, so thank you so much for the for the kind words. Um, um, I, I didn't really feel I was being described with all the uh, uh, the, the the kind words. I think primarily, um, I I hope to um, maybe bring a perspective to the lecture series that um, is based in uh, survey research, um, as. Uh, the introducers have mentioned I work for the Afrobarometer. Uh, my studies have been funded uh, through the Afrobarometer. Um, so really, uh, I guess my one of the aims of this presentation is is to maybe um, uh, shine some uh, insight or shine some light into uh, 
maybe some interesting ways how we can use uh, survey data that is available to uh, bridge some of the gaps in available data, uh, especially if we look at uh, maybe areas in Africa or the broader developing world. Um, I'm, as I said, uh, or as uh, Leslie mentioned, I'm joining you from uh, Cape Town. I really uh, would have liked to have visited uh, BYU campus uh, in person, but um, hope, hopefully third time lucky the, uh, the next Afrobarometer speaker uh, gets to uh, actually uh, visit you in person. So I today want to talk to you about asking about inequality, um, exploring measurement and consequences of inequality in Africa using value survey data. So this uh, research that I'm going to be drawing from in parts is based on my thesis chapters or some of the thesis chapters uh, in parts on uh, some working papers. And uh, I, I should mention that in parts, um, the uh, some of the findings have been presented as uh, manuscripts to the uh, annual meeting uh, of the ASA uh, past year. So uh, what I want to do is just maybe to begin with, uh, just give you a sort of hands up warning. Um, George Box, a, a very well known British statistician, um, once famously remarked, or at least it's been, um, uh, he's been quoted as, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Uh, and, and I guess what, what we mean by that is um, statistical analyses, um, uh, empirical data uh, by extension, will always have its limitations because it makes certain decisions as to what to measure and what not to measure. Uh, and I think especially when we talk about inequality, as you will for the remainder of this um, lecture series, uh, I think more and more you'll, you'll realize that uh, whenever you're tasked with measuring something, you're making a decision as to what you're measuring and what you're not measuring. Um, so I just want to set that up uh, as, as maybe a sort of warning at the beginning of this lecture is that um, we're obviously talking about very complex and very uh, maybe um, uh, diverse uh, issues in terms of measurement, in terms of aggregation, in terms of uh, computation. Um, all of the uh, all of the results that I'll be presenting today uh, obviously have a, 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 a plethora of limitations. But uh, really, what I think George Box's uh, quote is useful to remind us of is that if we don't try and measure something as good as we can, uh, well, then really just a, a random guess is the best we have. So, albeit limited, uh, using survey data might actually provide us with some interesting insights, uh, although. Uh, maybe some uh, disagree as to, um, you know, some of the finer details. Um, the results and, and the data I'm presenting by definition uh, will be quantitative. Uh, and I fully acknowledge and want to set out that uh, there's uh, obviously very, very important country level analysis, country level context uh, that I won't be able to uh, delve into. This is really a uh, search for more general patterns at the country level, so to speak rather than looking at individual cases um, um, uh, in specifically. So what do I want to talk to you about? So specifically, I want to talk to you about inequality and the possible effects on democracy. And by ex uh, exploring and unpacking this, uh, this relationship between the two, I'll, I'll be talking about some of the measurement issues. So, I thought if I'm talking about inequality, uh, and I'm talking about you know some something that is sort of seen as a hot topic, uh, that is rather ambiguous uh, to define, that is difficult to measure, uh, I might as well add a second big word that is difficult uh, to measure and ambiguous to define, uh, i.e., democracy. So specifically, the consequences that I'll be looking at in in today's uh, presentation will be uh, dealing with um, how inequality and democracy. Um, can be linked. Uh, another point I, I wanted to make on the previous slide is um, all of the results that I'm presenting should really be seen as uh, correlational. Um, so I, I, I will try and use language that reflects uh, the correlational na nature of the results, uh, but I, I, might, uh, I might slip and actually um, use words or language that, that are probably more appropriate of causal relations, but uh, really we, we need to be quite careful. So when we think about inequality, uh, probably uh, most of us uh, have, have sort of 
witnessed or uh, have seen the rise in interest in inequality and the consequences of inequality uh, in probably the past decade or so. Um, although anecdotal, uh, Pinker notes uh, um, a, a tenfold increase in the proportion of New York Times articles published between 2009 and 2016, which contain the word inequality as a title. Uh, we've seen the Occupy movement, uh, which is really, you know, in parts at least, uh, addressing issues of uh, individual, of group uh, inequalities. Uh, and we've seen the likes of, you know, Thomas Piketty and, and, and Stieglitz, Robert Reich, uh, become almost mainstream thinkers and mainstream uh, figures, obviously uh, greatly uh, academically acclaimed. But, you know, when, when, when your non-academic mother suddenly talks to you about Thomas Piketty, you realize that it's something that has hit a nerve and all of a sudden everybody's uh, running out and reading, uh, you know, 1,000 page uh, economic books by a French economist. Uh, probably something that is, you know, quite a sort of uh, topical uh, uh, indication of how topical the issue is. But really, um, you know, when, you, when, when we think about inequality, uh, and we, when we read about inequality, um, there, there's a lot of conceptual ambiguity. What, what, what are we relating this inequality to? Are we talking about material inequality, immaterial uh, inequality, uh, inequalities of outcome, opportunity, for example? But even if we define we're talking about material inequality, uh, we, we, we really need to be very careful as to compare apples to apples in terms of what different re uh, researchers and different uh, writers are working on. So whom are we comparing uh, to? We, we have, uh, you know, Milanovic's a com a contribution in terms of global inequality, but we can also think about uh, comparing people within countries or uh, comparing countries to one another. So what is the unit of analysis? Whom are we comparing people to? And then lastly, how are we actually measuring inequality? What does it mean for something? Um, uh, how do we produce uh, an inequality statistic? And uh, really, these questions will, will produce uh, a, a great deal of diverse and differenti uh, differentiation within the literature. Again, uh, I, I just want to uh, clarify that obviously uh, I, 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 I'm not able to delve into uh, these differentiated uh, uh, problems or, or measurement issues in great detail, uh, but it's something that I just want to point out. Um, and, and then besides that, really, on a, on, a, on a sort of different level, we need to think about, well, uh, what, how, does it, how do we think and what does it mean for something to be equal or unequal? Um, so are there cultural differences that we need to bear in mind? Now, when we think about the consequences of inequality um, uh, on democracy, there's a, there's a few sort of big studies that we need to think about, at least in the last uh, sort of two decades. And these have really found... Um, primarily at country level, that high levels of income and wealth inequality, so material inequality of outcome, um, have been linked to decreasing support for democracy, for example, less political participation, decreases in political interest and social trust and tolerance, um, amongst other things such as decreased public health, increased corruption, uh, less life satisfaction. So we see really a whole host of um, connections that have been made where uh, inequality or high levels of inequality, depending on whether we uh, view inequality as a continuous or a categorical um, a measurement, uh, where inequality is the independent variable that is uh, leading to something else or having uh, some form of effect on something else. Um, but in this instance, really, uh, Africa is uh, in, in many ways a critical case. Um, that, that has thus far really largely been overlooked. Now, why do I say that? Well, it's been overlooked really because um, a lot of the research in the past has been uh, on a very limited number of cases, i.e. North America, Western Europe, uh, to a growing extent, um, uh, East Asia uh, and South Asia. But really, if we look at um, a lot of uh, Central America, uh, if we look at a lot of um, the developing world in Africa and, and East Asia, there's, there's little or less uh, evidence really to, to uh, empirically uh, link inequality and uh, in an indirect and direct, uh, direct effects of democracy. But Africa is a critical case if we think about it. Um, we have this overlap of fairly high levels of inequality in terms of income and wealth, in some instances, extreme levels. 
Um, I'll talk about some regional differences in just a moment. And at the same time, we really have um, a, a, a situation in terms of the regimes in Africa, where many are characterized as, as being hybrid political regimes that have both democratic and non-democratic elements. Uh, we obviously also have uh, 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 regimes that are purely non-democratic, and we have uh, a number of cases that would, would be seen as purely democratic. So if we were to posit that inequality and democracy are linked in some, in some way, Africa would seem like a critical case where if this is really something that is globally true, we ought to see a strong pattern. Um, but moreover, Africa is a really interesting case and an important case, because if we think about democratization in Africa, and largely we're talking late 80s, but especially then uh, early, uh, early 1990s, the sort of democratic decade, as it's called in Africa, there was an explicit expectation that democratization, so a change in the political regime, would lead to uh, a change or a, an addressing of material conditions. Um, and here I want to uh, just read part of a quote by Claude Aki, a, a very well uh, renowned um, a Nigerian scholar, who in 1993, so this is really the beginning of, um, of the democratic decade in Africa, not, not, not in, in Nigeria at that point, but in Africa. Uh, and, and, and he writes, in order for African democracy to be relevant and sustainable, it will have to de-emphasize abstract political rights and stress concrete economic rights because the demand for democracy in Africa draws much of its impetus from the prevailing economic conditions within. Ordinary Africans see their political empowerment through democratization as an essential part of the progress of getting the economic agenda right at last and ensuring that the development project is managed better and its rewards more evenly distributed. The feasibility of democratization will depend partly on the correlation of this progress with better economic prospects. So the original or the initial uh, motivation and, and draw for democratization, and I really, I, I, I need to set this aside because it is very diverse and very, uh, uh, very complex, uh, but a, a large part was the expectation of economic change and improvement, uh, as I think very succinctly summarized by uh, Claude Aki. So if we look at what has happened, if we look at how we uh, need to think about uh, inequality in Africa, this is a breakdown uh, um, using the Gini coefficient. So the Gini coefficient is a, is a, is a method of calculating uh, an uh, and, uh, inequality score using the net income. Um, and we're looking at world regions, so to speak. So each of these lines represents a world region. Uh, and within each region, we've computed a median score uh, as a way to, to, to sort of mitigate the effect of very low and very high uh, scores of inequality. So we're really looking at the, the sort of um, uh, the, 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 the middle score, so to speak. Um, and what we see, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa here um, in, in the sort of Burgundy line, I guess, um, is firstly, we have relatively uh, consistent patterns. This, uh, this is a timeline from 1980 to uh, 2000. So uh, that, that would fall or that would describe the sort of democratic decade in Africa. We have fairly stable uh, conditions, maybe if we exclude that spike in the early 1980s. Uh, and we have, relatively speaking, high levels of inequality. Um, so again, it's, it, this is something I, I, I sort of briefly mentioned in the previous slide. When we speak of something being high inequality or low inequality, um, what we are really saying is compared to something that we would posit as being a, a, a decent or an acceptable level, right? So there's no sort of universal agreement as such that a genie of 50 is just simply too high. Um, it's different from country to country and there's cultural variation obviously as well. Uh, really we're comparing here different world regions. So Sub-Saharan Africa, relatively stable over time and relatively high relative to other countries uh, that being. But when we start unpacking this inequality, so again, we're looking at the, uh, the Gini now at country levels, so not the median by region, but at country level. This is for 2013. Um, I should mention, especially when we talk about Africa, oftentimes uh, we have an issue of time incongruence of 
comparable data. So if you if you're wondering why some of the the the, the charts seem to be jumping around in time, this is always trying to uh, get the closest uh, approximation uh, or congruence rather between the different slides. And what we see is here we have darker shades for higher Gini coefficients, uh, lighter shades, and and sort of patterns for for uh, lower uh, Gini coefficients. The first thing I want to point out is that um, we see straight away a fairly strong north-south, excuse me, divide within sub-Saharan Africa. So we've excluded uh, the Middle East or the North Africa region, MENA. Um, we really see a strong north-south divide with Southern Africa, uh, South Africa, Botswana, Namibia, uh, Lesotho, Swaziland, which is now called Iswatini, uh, Zambia having very high levels of inequality relative to the other countries, Central African Republic being the sort of outlier in Central Africa. And, and the more north we go and the more west we go, we seem to have uh, lower uh, levels of uh, inequality using the Gini coefficient for uh, net income. Um, there's different literatures on why this uh, regional or why this country pattern exists. Um, one, of, one of the explanations is, is uh, rooted within um, different um, colonial systems uh, with uh, countries that were former colonies of the British uh, having uh, substantially higher levels of income inequality than uh, uh, countries that were colonized uh, or colonies of the French. So when we talk about inequality in Africa, at a, at a continental or sub, uh, at a regional level, we say the levels are very high, but that always blurs variation within uh, even a median score. So if we move on, even if we look at a different perspective, we have to say that although levels are different, the trajectories over time are also different. So we saw two slides that the, the, the relative uh, or the median score, sorry, uh, of uh, income inequality in Africa is, is, is relatively stable. There's obviously some variation, but relatively narrow band within which uh, inequality changes. Um, but if we actually look at the changes over time, um, so we're now looking at, uh, again, a, around a 20 year, um, a 20 year uh, period. This really is the beginning of the uh, African democratic decade and then the, uh, the 2000s, we see that we have very divergent and different looking trajectories. Um, so this again is, is the Gini coefficient, this time applied to consumption expenditure. Um, again, why am I jumping around? Oftentimes it's just the, the available data, uh, unfortunately. And we see that that relatively stable uh, um, trajectory of income inequality is actually masking very looking different developments. So we have falling inequality uh, in 13 countries. We have rising inequality in a number of countries. We have inverted U-shape where we have an increase and then a drop, and we have the opposite, the U-shape uh, in the bottom, uh, bottom right-hand quadrant. So without going into too much detail for each country, um, the, the important thing I, I, I would like to just convey is that when we think about uh, inequality at anything but the national level, and I, I'm going to argue in a couple of slides, even within the national level, we are making, uh, we, are, we are trusting our aggregation method to an extent that we're probably missing quite an important part um, of the story. So I also, because I work for Afrobromis and I like, like the data, uh, we can also add a bit of context to the claim that Claude Arke made. Uh, now almost 20 years ago. So this is uh, displaying responses from a 2011-2013 uh, uh, round five survey question, which asks people what is the essential characteristic of democracy? Because we might argue, well, you know, almost, almost 30 years ago, uh, you know, people might have had very different expectations, but what about today? And what we see here is results for two questions. The one um, uh, asking, or both of them asking, what is the essential characteristic? And I've highlighted here the columns um, or the bars that represent um, responses that deal with some form of equality or uh, notion of fairness. So on the left-hand side, we have the government narrows the gap between the rich and the poor, so addressing uh, income or wealth inequality. And that's the second most common response uh, uh, apart from actually uh, choosing uh, leaders in free and fair elections, which is probably uh, what we would all uh, 
intuitively respond is the sort of core definition of what it means to be democratic, right? Some call it the sort of minimalist definition of democracy um, is, is having elections of some, of some nature that allow people to uh, choose their leaders. On the right-hand side, we have the second question. So there's two questions with different response options. And here we have the most frequent response option being that the government ensures job opportunities for all. So again, not directly linked to uh, inequality as such, but the notion of opportunities for all. So we have a sense of equality, of fairness, uh, of parity to some extent. We can also look at uh, data that was collected in a previous round in, in 2005 and 2006. Uh, this time we only have data for 18 countries, which deals with the changes in the gaps between rich and poor. Now, again, not going into too much detail, what we see is the darker red colors are, are negative assessments, and then the gray uh, is, is, a, is a neutral or, or it hasn't changed, while the green uh, is, is a positive. We see just eyeball tests that most countries, people are actually giving negative evaluations. So they're saying it's become worse, the gaps have become bigger. So if we think back to my initial argument, why it's important to look at inequality and democracy in, in Africa, Again, going back to the Aki claim where, where, where we can say, well, the initial or partially the expectation was that this would be addressed. Going by, this, uh, by these responses, again, these are representative, nationally representative surveys, we would say the majority of surveyed people are actually negative, uh, and that might actually then um, uh, trickle down to um, democracy. And lastly, we can look at government evaluations, again, red meaning negative evaluations and just eyeball uh, test we see that in 2016 2018 that was when round seven was conducted the majority of people in all surveyed countries actually give negative evaluations of how government is handling this issue of narrowing, narrowing income gaps between rich and poor so the first thing i really want to sort of emphasize at this point is regardless of whether or not we, we, we understand the differences across countries. By looking at survey data, we can provide a different perspective to the data that I showed you uh, pre in previous slides. So while we have levels of inequality at an aggregated level that are changing over time, we can provide an additional perspective, not a better perspective, but a different perspective that allows us really to add context to uh, these levels. So again, coming back to the issue of, well, how much inequality do people really accept? What are differences across countries? How do we understand what level is too much and what level is fine? This might be an interesting way to approach that problem by looking at, well, how do people actually evaluate the government in terms of, um, in terms of addressing this? So, in the interest of time, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk about these. But so let's say we, we now want to understand the relationship, uh, uh, really linking up levels of inequality. And on the other hand, we want to look at um, how people um, feel about democracy, right? So that's sort of my, my underlying research interest. So what we have here is, is, is basically a, a country level correlation. Uh, on the x-axis, we have income inequality using uh, the Gini coefficient. So again, Gini simply describes the way that uh, a score was computed uh, using pre-tax and transfer income. So a slightly different uh, sort of raw source, I guess. Taxes and transfers, uh, this is especially important when we look at uh, Southern Africa. So a slight deviation maybe. Uh, South Africa has extremely high levels of inequality, pre-tax and pre-transfer. But South Africa has probably, uh, arguably, one of the most comprehensive uh, transfer and, and, and um, uh, financial redistribution, government financial redistribution um, um, programs or, or, or uh, uh, yeah, I guess, projects. So we, we need to be very careful because post-transfer, inequality, income inequality looks very different, especially at the lower end of the income scale in South Africa, for example, than it does pre and post transfer. Uh, on the Y axis, we have uh, an Afrobarometer question that asks people whether they support democracy or whether it 
regime type doesn't really matter to them. Uh, and what we see as a correlation here, well, I'm, I, some of you uh, might, might be more versed in, in reading this than others, but basically what we see is there's no relationship. So regardless of what your income inequality level is, support for democracy stays within a fairly narrow band. So this is really uh, a, sort of a, a null finding in terms of our maybe underlying hypothesis. Now, we might ask, well, why is this the case? Uh, and, and well, I guess the sort of uh, pessimistic response would be, well, it, it might not, it might simply not matter, uh, in, in which case we could have a, you know, a fairly long Q&A. But this is really where I want to turn to uh, thinking about what we're measuring and how we're measuring something and um, what assumptions we're making when we're using measurements uh, and applying them to predicting or associating them with other ways of measuring something. Now, most of the literature on inequality and the consequences of inequality, especially at the com in, in terms of comparative studies, use some form of national level aggregated score of inequality. Um, however, increasingly research suggests that people at the individual level, people are generally fairly bad, meaning inaccurate, at assessing their relative level, of, uh, a relative position within an income distribution, the overall level of inequality, uh, as well as you know, understanding what are top and what are as a, uh, um, certain uh, certain quintiles, for example, in terms of income. So we're assuming that we can use uh, aggregated data to predict or to understand variation or variance uh, in, in terms of individual behavior and individual attitudes. Now, this might be problematic. The other issue, and I'll, I'll talk to the problem in, in, in just a bit more, the other issue, especially when we're thinking about Africa or the developing world, more broadly, is the issue of poor numbers. So do we have issues, uh, the poor numbers as a reference to the German book, uh, very highly recommended, um, is, is, is how much can we actually trust official data uh, in certain countries or instances where which we require in order to compute something. So if we look at, uh, for example, the availability of comparable uh, data, again, this is about understanding a pattern across countries rather than understanding a single case. Just on the right hand side, what we see is, is really uh, the variance in available surveys with darker colored countries uh, being countries where we have more surveys available, low, uh, lighter colored countries being lesser countries. Um, so great variance and even in countries with a lot of a lot in, in inverted commas, uh, we don't really have that many country uh, uh, that many service to go by so i i just in the interest of time i want to uh, just end this sort of slide uh, section with uh, a quote from gimbelson treisman a relatively recent but but fairly influential paper that's uh, being being picked up quite a lot uh, and and they observe a strange inconsistency underlies much recent scholarship on the one hand theories assume that individuals know the income distribution on the other uh, hand, scholars complain that data available to test theories, even in developed countries or developed democracies, are dubious and massively unreliable. If experts despair at the quality of data, it seems odd to assume the public is perfectly uh, informed. So how does maybe survey or value survey data allow us to bridge this issue uh, in the context of um, Sub-Saharan Africa? So I, in my research, uh, have relied on a question from the Afrobarometer, which asks people to assess their individual relative position within uh, a national context. So I'm looking at national level inequality and then asking people to place themselves within that uh, relative spectrum. And the question is, in general, how do you rate your living conditions compared to those of other Botswana, South Africans, etc.? Uh, and we have five different response options ranging from much worse to much better with the central observation uh, better. We see that about a third of people say they feel better, but there is quite a bit of country variation. Um, and then we see that gradually, uh, if we move outward from this uh, central observation, um, most people feel fairly close to the same or marginally worse or marginally better. Oftentimes we see this um, in survey research 
which is sort of generally described as a sort of perceived median effect. So people sort of generally report uh, to sort of imagined median as such. So to, to understand the relationship between inequality and democracy, what I did in part of my research was looked at uh, the 2016-2018 Afrobarometer round seven data, uh, which comprised 45,000 individual cases. Um, as we've seen, there is a lot of country variance. So what I did was use a, a nest, or given the nested uh, nature of the data, I used a multi-level model, which allowed me to really uh, sort of control for uh, the fact that I'm looking at countries uh, nested within a bigger data set. And then I used uh, the, the perception of individual relative position as my predictor variable, and then uh, a number of dependent variables, which looked at different aspects um, of uh, democracy. And, and I used Pippa Norris's framework that others have previously uh, developed of political support, so diffused to specific support. And specifically, I want to report the results on support for democracy, demand for democracy. So this is the sort of most diffused form of support satisfaction of democracy, so how democracy is working in practice, and then trust in elected representatives. And for all of these models, um, and I'm not going to report on these uh, in, in too much detail, I included literature-specific uh, literature uh, control variables, which I uh, included in effect to uh, hold constant so that I can say, well, given what we know, uh, does does uh, the inclusion of people's relative perceived position improve the model and, and does it have an individual significant effect on what I'm trying to measure? Now, I, I'm going to not, not bore you with, 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 my, uh, um, with my summary tables, but what I want to do is just briefly talk about um, some of the key findings. So the first thing I want to look at is support for democracy. Importantly, this is something I, I need to stress, support for democracy is uh, an attitude, it's not an evaluation. We, we can debate whether or not the two are really uh, that separate, but the question really is about, do people support democracy in principle, irrespective of what their country situation is? And what I find is that feeling severely deprived and severely advantaged, so very well and very badly, uh, is significantly associated with less support. So what that means is that people who feel equal to others, irrespective of their absolute poverty level, irrespective also of their country inequality, which I controlled for, feeling equal to others makes people more, or is associated with uh, feeling more supportive to the idea of democracy. Now, whether people all share the same idea is, is another uh, question that we need uh, to think about. But, Talk is cheap, and, and oftentimes the, the literature around uh, sort of survey research on democracy talks about the problem of, you know, people, people pay lip service to democracy. They just say, yep, yeah, uh, democracy is great. I, I've heard everybody's supporting it. I'm all for it. But do people also hold attitudes that are uh, contrary to the, the, the norms and the, the ideals of uh, democracy? And this is what we call demand for democracy in, in, in the Afrobarometer. And basically, people need to, on the one hand, say they support democracy. And on the other hand, they also need to reject non-democratic regimes, such as one man, one party, and military rule. And I again find the same pattern, that when we talk about this attitude towards democracy, that people who feel worse off and better off are less supportive of, or less demanding of democracy than people who feel equal. Now, interestingly, the working hypothesis was that people who feel worse off would say, well, this isn't working for me. I'm actually open towards non-democratic regimes. Interestingly, what I found is that people who feel better off equally have views uh, saying, well, other options might, might be viable. I'm open towards um, non-democratic regime forms. Now, non-democratic regime forms, especially if we think about one party, rule, uh, military rule, uh, within the context of, of, uh, of Sub-Saharan Africa should pro have to be viewed very, very differently than they would in, in, in other parts of the world. South Africa is, is by all measures a one party, although the, the, the ANC has coalitions, but the dominant party has always been the ANC since obviously um, elections were introduced. 
So the attitudes towards democracy seem to be linked to sentiments or feelings uh, of equality rooted in that notion of, I feel that my living standards are similar to others. But next I changed and I switched to actually evaluating democracy. So how much do people feel satisfied with the working of democracy? And here I find something very different that we see rather than people being if, who feel equal being the most supportive of the idea of democracy, we now have a linear relation between the two where people who feel equal being more satisfied than people who feel worse off, but less satisfied than people who feel better off. So it's egocentric motivations, seemingly, that actually drives satisfaction uh, with democracy, which uh, would, would seem maybe, uh, again, back to the, the archaic quote, uh, in line to what uh, the literature in the democratic, uh, in the democratization in Africa would suggest, but maybe counter to uh, what some of the uh, more Western um, views on inequality and um, uh, democracy would suggest. And lastly, I looked at uh, the role of uh, trust and I found the same, that people who uh, feel equal to others are more trusting of representative government institutions than people who feel worse off. But at the same time, people who feel equal are less trusting uh, than people who feel better off. So in summary, when we look at the four models or the four uh, slides combined, it seems to be the case that when we talk about attitudes towards democracy, more democrat people feel more democratic who feel equal to others rather than not feeling equal to others but when we think about evaluation so the working of democracy in the real world what we see is that the sense of getting ahead of being better or perceiving to be better off uh, higher up is actually what's driving uh, or what's informing um, uh, the, the evaluations of democracy in practice there's obviously some limitations that I need to address. Um, I, 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 in the interest of time, I, I'll, uh, I'll skip these. They are important, obviously. Uh, the most important being the reliance on a single measure, although I did run robustness checks for most of the models. And then just because I am here also in, in, in a way representing Afrobarometer, um, I, I would be amiss of not mentioning that the Afrobarometer doesn't collect all of this data um, for, for its own employees, but it collects data for, uh, for the general public. So uh, all the data uh, you know, are free of charge and publicly available, um, a great resource. Um, all of the data, I can attest to it uh, through countless uh, you know, uh, late nights and long, long weekends of finalizing data sets, you know, has, been, has been peer reviewed and is of very high quality. Um, so it's, it's a great resource that, that hopefully a, a lot of you find useful. Um, I realize I've, I've, I've probably stretched your, um, um, your, your attention span slightly and um, thank you so much. Uh, I am happy to uh, answer any questions. I, I don't know if it's possible. I'm also happy to obviously uh, maybe for those in the room stay on um, a, a couple minutes longer because I have taken people's time. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions of clarification or, or, or just um, more, more generally feedback um, that, that, that you have. Excellent. Thank you uh, so much, Thomas, for a very engaging presentation. Uh, we, do, we have 50 minutes uh, for questions. Uh, we have two sets of people attending the, this talk. Uh, we have um, about 20 or 30 people here with us live in the room, and we also have uh, a number of people attending uh, via Zoom. Uh, if you would like to ask a question uh, and you're here in the room, we have a mic here. We need you to come up to the mic in order for us to pick it up on the recording. Uh, we just ask that you state your name um, and that you ask your question. Uh, feel free if you would like to ask a question after the current questioner to stand uh, behind them. You're welcome to, to, to get in line in the queue. Uh, I've also asked uh, Leslie Hadfield to uh, check to see what, what questions uh, there may be on Zoom. So uh, if you are on Zoom and you'd like to submit a question through chat, uh, we may also be able to take your question there. 
So uh, for those in the, in the room, if you have a question, please please come on up and, and uh, ask it. I, I will kick it off, Thomas, with one question. So you, you repeatedly emphasize that uh, there's a correlation um, uh, in your models between attitudes and support for democracy and perceptions of, of equality. And I'm wondering if you could speculate as to why. So what do you think is going on that leads us to see that relationship? Uh, should I respond to the question or are we bundling questions, sorry? Uh, I think yeah, you can respond to that question now. Yeah, I think one of the uh, really important sort of country level uh, factors that also came out, but I, I think one thing that is really important is if, if we look at the, the role uh, that uh, political leadership has had uh, in many countries uh, of, of really uh, forming uh, the economic success and the economic well-being of individuals and communities. Uh, Kenya is a great example. Uh, if, if we look at these sort of early, uh, early years um, after Kenya's uh, independence, where really it was almost the, the, the sort of personal responsibility of uh, elected, democratically elected leaders um, to, to financially um, um, ensure or to ensure the financial and material well-being. I, I, I think there's definitely a, a strong root in, in that sense. Uh, and I think it comes out in the Claude Arke uh, as well, where uh, the Claude Arke quote as well, where um, the, the expectation of, of democrat, liberal democratic rights and freedoms is, uh, is, is important, but um, there, there, is, there is an inherent need uh, really for very, very basic material um, satisfaction and, and satisfaction of requirements. And, um, I, you know, the, the, the Afrobarometer collects a lot of data on, on basic access to uh, services and, and experiences of poverty. Um, and, and I think just by looking at, at really some of the, uh, well, struggles really that one could imagine that come out of the data that, that you see, just people not having access to very basic services, people going without food on a regular basis, people, uh, you know, struggling with, with medical care, um, you know, just, just accessing basic medicines. Um, I, I think it's, it's, it's very, very plausible to, uh, to, to see that, that, that continuation of, um, of political leadership being um, partially, obviously, a vehicle to achieve a representation, but also partially um, a vehicle to access um, material well-being sounds maybe a bit, bit far-fetched, but uh, at least satisfaction of basic requirements. And I think um, uh, maybe the idea of democracy uh, again, this is very varied by country, is uh, still far more materialistic uh, than, than maybe the outside perspective would, would imagine it to be. Um, and, and I think that's, in some, in some instances, it's, it's something that I think is, is informed by, by culture and by history. Uh, but in many other cases, I think it's, it's very much informed by just really simple basic uh, requirements that people have um, just making ends meet so to speak i i wrote a uh, i wrote a paper uh, during my during my studies on uh, what makes people say the, the, the issp a, a different survey that includes a, a couple of african countries south africa nigeria morocco they ask people on a scale from zero to ten uh, you know, where in, where, in, where, in the, where in society do you see, you know, people like you? Uh, the people like you is just a, a very common phrase that's used in survey research. Um, and um, the, the, the strongest predictor wasn't people's absolute household income. It wasn't people's, uh, I use certain proxies for class. Um, it, it, was, it was people's experience of making ends meet. Um, that really informed whether people felt they were towards the lower end or in the, in the middle or the upper end of uh, their perceived you know, scale within society. 
Um, and, I, and I think that is, that is also quite telling in that the, the, the real world struggles that many, many people, I mean, I'm in Cape Town, Cape Town, uh, probably if, if you've ever been to Cape Town or you visit, uh, you know, you, you would think that you, you're, you're standing somewhere in, uh, in California, uh, but, but at the same time, you go four or five miles inland uh, to the Cape Flats and people have, you know, very, very basic struggles that maybe from an outside perspective, one would imagine have, you know, far been, far been solved. Um, you know, people just lacking the means to get to work, for example, not, not only being unemployed, but actually lacking the means to get out and find work. Um, sorry, I'll, I'll, give, I'll, I'll give people uh, an opportunity to um, ask more questions. Thank you very much. Do we have uh, other questions in the room from any of our live participants? Uh, Leslie, do we have anything that's coming in on chat that you'd like to share? I don't have anything on uh, through the chat. Anyone online yet? Um, and those of you who are on Zoom, you may uh, send a, a question to me directly or just directly in the chat. Okay, uh, please, please do interrupt us if you do have something uh, from, from our Zoom chat, Leslie. Um, uh, Thomas, maybe I'll just uh, share one more anecdote and get your reflection. Uh, I'm a scholar of North Africa and uh, very interested in, in the success of democratic transitions there. Tunisia has been one of the, the most watched of the democratic transitions in uh, in North Africa in the past decade. Uh, just this past year, Tunisia uh, may have lost its democracy. Uh, the, the parliament was suspended. Uh, the president essentially has shifted political rights uh, in ways that are uncertain in the future. And uh, one of the common explanations for that is that Tunisia's democracy has failed to provide any noticeable economic benefit. Mm -hmm. um, to, to people in that country. And so uh, my, my question is, for new democracies to survive, do we have any evidence that they need to actually perform well uh, economically? Um, or um, in people's minds, does the failure of an economic project also imply the failure of democracy? I mean, the, the, the whole, I mean, Tunisia, I guess, within the context of the Arab Spring is probably what most people would, would point to as being the most successful case if, if we define the, the resemblance of democratic institutions as a success. Um, and, 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 and the role of um, sort of economic and with that, you know, social or societal dignity uh, is definitely something that I think is, is played a very big role. Um, I mean, arguably the, the, the sort of spark that set it off, not, not literally obviously was, you know, the, the idea of, of people's right to earn a livelihood and, 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 and make, a, a make a better living for themselves, just being completely, uh, uh, completely taken up by, by a very small state elite with, with maybe some uh, uh, military in there for for good mix, especially if we look at you know Egypt and and, and some of the countries um, where the military plays a big role. Um, I, I think I think at the very least there needs to be a strong sense of of hope and uh, of promise. Um, I mean, if if we look at the literature on on democracy on democratization. Um, there's a sort of nice, nice, uh, I guess, uh, agreement that democratic systems can survive for, for quite some time if the incumbents aren't supported. So specific support um, doesn't need to be particularly high, um, but what needs to be there is a sort of reservoir of goodwill, so to speak, um, which, which is sort of diffuse support. And I think uh, a lot of the countries that see uh, these sort of early stages of, of really moving into democratic regimes, um, they oftentimes, I think, fall flat because 
the, the leaders are what what is what is driving um, what is driving that initial initial push, and and if the if the leaders disappoint within uh, you know a, a, a four year period or an eight year period or however long they manage to stay in power, there's there's oftentimes a very limited sort of reservoir of diffuse political support for the norms of democracy and for the for the basic uh, sort of political uh, um, you know the political structures that need to be in place for democracy to work. Uh, you know, Zambia is a, is, is a good example as well, where oftentimes uh, in the past we've seen uh, you know democratic movements that that start as as uh, you know opposition parties, oftentimes sort of reassembling the pieces of previous parties and previous coalitions uh, or super coalitions in many cases, um, but. Really, the 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 moment uh, oftentimes these these new new so to speak uh, leaders come into power, uh, you know they they face great uphill struggles because it's really them and and maybe a small politically well known uh, group of people that are sort of driving uh, driving political change that is far more systemic than uh, you know just saying we are the you know the democratic front of of X, Y, and Z, but really, once it once it's once it's about changing the structures and 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 the way the game works, um, so to speak, it, it it's then that I think governments, political leaders, uh, civil society groups that are that are aiming towards um, more democracy, whatever that might might mean in the concrete, that they actually really need a lot more time and a lot more. Sort of incremental savings, uh, so to speak. It, it, it's it's a bit like um, 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 sorry, I, I, I've 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 lost my point there. But I think that's 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 really the the, the main problem is that um, leaders who 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 seem to be or even movements that want to achieve democratic uh, improvement or improvement that goes in a way that would be seen as democratic. Um, they they still uh, at some point require that that sort of deep rooted um, uh, reservoir of of goodwill and and patience that people have, um, and 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 political leaders might come and go. Uh, if people agree on the fundamental rules of how a political system should run and how a political system should work, um, I think that's really what 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 sustains uh, a, a regime in tough times and we could we could go to Tanzania uh, with, with you know the changes that Magafuli was able to uh, really make in, in, in relatively short time um, and, and probably two or three years before or even even shorter before Magafuli came into power um, people had maybe on the, from, from an outside perspective different views on uh, the state of democracy in, in, in Tanzania, albeit a, a, a you know a, a one-party state and, and uh, etc. But um, I, I think someone like Magafuli has has shown, and there's numerous other examples where really the the the, the structure of democracy in many instances is 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 quite weak still. It's 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 there, and and by by all means in terms of. Um, you know the procedural uh, implementation, even the uh, constitutional implementation. Um, democracy appears to be, you know, the only game in town. To, to use the famous moniker from 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 the literature. Um, but but if if the people that inhabit these different levels and and the, the broader base of of public support and public legitimacy for a system uh, are, are weak or insufficient. Um, you know these things can can change rather quickly because there's not enough stop guards and there's not enough uh, you know groups and entities and at the end of the end of the day individuals that that say you know this isn't how it's supposed to be uh, and then it's quite easy as we've seen in Tunisia uh, unfortunately uh, we we survey in Tunisia I have, uh, colleagues in Tunisia who, who I'm I'm friendly with. Um, who you know who describe the changes on a day to day basis, and it's 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 not just you know the the the, the big uh, sort of uh, the big picture democracy uh, sort of headlines. It's uh, 
really day-to-day -day, um, changes in the way that people um, go about life, but also feel about the, the opportunities, especially in a political sense. Um, and, and undoubtedly that, um, that, that has strong linkages to how people uh, economically feel that they are being treated, but also economically how they feel, um, you know, a country uh, vests opportunity for them. Thank you very much. Uh, our time has come to an end. Uh, if, if you are on Zoom still or with us live, if you could just give uh, our speaker a round of applause. Thank you very much, Thomas, for joining us. Thank you.